Now let's introduce the uh, Funding, Bitcoin, and Open Source Development Committee um, panel hosted by our own Yvenya Polistrik uh, from the MIT Bitcoin Committee and uh, with members Arsh Malou from the HR Foundation, Adam Jonas from Chaincode, and Mike Schmidt from Brink. Greetings and warm welcome to all our esteemed uh, panel participants and to distinguished audience. And uh, my name is Yevgenia Polishchuk. I'm a MIT BTC member and also uh, a member of organizational committee MIT Bitcoin Max for 2024. And I'm also a Fulbright Visiting Scholar uh, hosted by MIT Crypto Economics Lab. I'm very happy to be here and uh, to moderate a panel funding Bitcoin and open source development. And uh, today we will talk about uh, funding aspects of uh, Bitcoin and open source development about uh, changing in the model, uh, funding model about uh, incentives of supporting uh, Bitcoin developers and uh, open source development. So, and I'm very happy to be surrounded uh, with the prominent uh, people from a uh, very contributive organization as uh, Brink Human Rights Foundation and uh, also uh, from <laughs> Chain Code, yeah. So, uh, I'm very happy to give you a floor and to, to introduce uh, yourself, guys. So, yeah. Hey, all. Mike Schmidt, contributor uh, to a few different projects. I am executive director at Brink, and Brink is an organization that's been around for four years that funds Bitcoin core developers. So not building on Bitcoin or building something like Bitcoin or a startup on Bitcoin, but the actual Bitcoin software that helps run the network. And we're funding seven engineers right now. We have an office in London where a bunch of the engineers work together and collaborate with high bandwidth communication. We also fund remote grantees uh, around the world. And uh, we're a 501c3, so we're entirely funded by the community and the community's initiative to want to support the good work that these developers are doing. Hey everyone, happy, happy halving, thrilled to be here. Um, my name is Arsh. I work at the Human Rights Foundation. Um, the Human Rights Foundation is a nonprofit organization focused on promoting and protecting human rights globally um, with the exclusive focus on authoritarian and closed societies. Um, I'm also the co-founder of Generation Bitcoin and the Bitcoin Students Network, uh, which focus on helping high school and college students learn about Bitcoin. Hello. Um, I'm Adam Jonas. I work at Chaincode Labs. Chaincode has been around for 10 years now. We were founded by Alex Marcos, who's an MIT alum, and his co-founder, Suha Staftuar. Um, we, do, we, we mostly employ people to work on Bitcoin protocol and Lightning protocol. Um, we also do a fair bit of education, which we'll talk about shortly. Great, great for such an insightful presentation and introduction. So with this, uh, we totally uh, put uh, the context of our for the conversation. And uh, I have the first questions to you all guys about what kind of educational activities you, do your organization provide and how these activities are funded. So probably sponsorship, donations, yeah. Tell me more about this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. let's start from you. We, we have a few different programs at Brink. One, and probably what we're most well known for, is our grants program, which compensates uh, developers that are already doing the work and contributing to the Bitcoin software and compensates them for full-time employment to continue to do that good work on the Bitcoin Core software. Uh, we've had some younger contributors come through a, a variety of mentorship efforts. We had a fellowship program uh, that, that lasted uh, a year long uh, that Gloria went through and went from a newer contributor out of university all the way through to being a full-time Bitcoin Core contributor. We've also had Nicholas who's gone through that fellowship program as well. More recently, we've started doing educational efforts um, for some junior contributors uh, flying or getting their expenses paid to travel to our London office, whether that's train, hotel, et cetera, expenses for uh, newer contributors to be in the office with these more senior contributors to have a, a sort of organic mentoring effort happen there. So we, we started that up in the last few months. Additionally, a lot of our engineers contribute to Bitcoin Optech, which is a technical news publication that covers Bitcoin and Lightning developments. 
So uh, we have uh, several of our engineers contribute to that. I contribute to that. If you're curious about Bitcoin technicals and don't want to be following the day to day, that's an interesting news source that you should consider subscribing to. It's a free newsletter, bitcoinopsops.org. Some of our engineers also contribute to something called Bitcoin Core PR Review Club. It's a way for people who are curious about what's going on with the software to kind of uh, dip their toe in the water. Uh, experienced contributors will do a write-up about a particular proposed change to the Bitcoin software with some context and some background and some hints. And uh, folks who attend this chat-based uh, meeting can follow along with how a more experienced contributor might look at a proposed set of changes to the code. And the idea there is to get newer contributors with their toe in the water and a little bit of familiarity with, with how to review code. Um, and then hopefully they can blossom into a more prolific contributor down the road. And also some of our engineers contribute to other mentoring efforts. We've had engineers who have been mentors for the Summer of Bitcoin program. We have one of our grantees that does some work with the Kala education program as well. And so um, I think to your other question of, of how we're funded, um, all, all of those efforts are something that the engineers have chosen to do on their own as part of their own initiative. We do fund their, their work and that includes those educational initiatives as well as our development initiatives through donations from the community. Actually, some of our donors are here today. Uh, I think earlier someone from Coinbase was speaking. They're, they're donors uh, from the exchange side of things. Uh, LightSpark, uh, financial infrastructure for Bitcoin and Lightning Tech ha have donated to Brink. And, and more recently, and we can get into this in, in a minute, is the, um, the, the, the Bitcoin ETF providers um, have uh, taken an interest in wanting to support the underlying software that supports uh, what, what they're building on. So we saw Hong from Bitwise earlier today, who was the first to come up with that sort of initiative, and we've had some others interested since then, um, and we can talk a little bit about that later, but that's where the money comes from to, to fund is the community, so thank you all. Yeah, so on the education side, um, ever since the Human Rights Foundation got into um, exploring how Bitcoin can be a useful tool for our community, um, we've been offering trainings and workshops and programming at our annual conference called the Oslo Freedom Forum, uh, which is early this June. Um, in addition to that, we do a lot of global advocacy and a lot of global workshops. So kind of going and showing different civil society groups and activists how to use Bitcoin and how to, how to buy it, custody it, um, how to use it safely, focusing on the privacy side. Um, in addition to not only funding open source developers, um, we also focus on funding education. So something that aligns with our mission statement of focusing on authoritarian governments and closed societies is um, we give funding to different organizations that are within that, you know, those countries and kind of fit within our mission statement, if that makes sense. So um, a lot of those being, um, you know, Bitcoin conferences, for example, communities, meetups, and kind of sparking grassroots adoption um, in terms of how we're funded a lot of institutional donors um, the bitcoin community obviously individuals and, and companies themselves uh, similar to mike you know I, I also see a couple of our um, generous donors in the crowd um, and including you know bitwise uh, for, for the etf portion of things but yeah um, it's really just the generosity of the bitcoin community and, and since we're not only a bitcoin um, you know, foundation or, or company, we have different streams for institutions and individuals as well. Thank you. Thank you. And do you so, have something? Yeah. yeah. Although I may have been cut off. Oh, there I am. Um, so uh, education is pretty near and dear to my heart. I got into Bitcoin through education. Um, I sort of found a side door. Um, and it's been, I think, a really important piece of the puzzle for Bitcoin's continued um, um, pipeline and survival. So uh, I sort of think about education in two different parts. Um, there's the programming part, and there's sort of like the product, like productization part of education. So 
on the product side, um, we need content and we need um, things that are packaged up that people can interact with. So these, this is you know curriculum, and this is uh, we're working on a game called Saving Satoshi. You should check out; it's pretty far along. Um, and we are you and things like tooling. So like um, it's really hard to find things related to Lightning on Google because Lightning uh, just put into Google um, just mainly comes up with hockey teams from Florida and um, sparks in the sky. And so like we need our own search engine so that people can actually find the stuff they're looking for. Um, we need uh, like you know, transcripts from events like this so that it becomes searchable and people can actually find the stuff they're looking for. Um, we need tooling so that people can run better simulations about how the network will respond to changes or um, how lightning payments um, just sort of like fly around the network when you're actually uh, making patches. So some of that is like, you know, there, there's a lot of infrastructural pieces and that, that's, those are product pieces. Um, and then there's the programming side. So the programming side, um, at least with chain code, was came along far before I arrived. Um, Blue Mat put together a residency in 2016, and um, that has been an onboarding. Um, uh, that, that that's been the onboarding like um, vector for a lot of people in terms of like just actually moving from a peripheral contributor to working on. Bitcoin open source full time. So, Carlo was a resident um, in 2019, um, and then we have things that are more like more accessible. So, not everybody is going to be able to fly to New York and spend three months um, in our office. And so, uh, we have things like the seminars, um, which are essentially like book clubs, which are packaged up curriculum where people can get together with other people around the world and connect on you know the best content on the planet. Reading Jameson Lops. Um, blog posts or um, looking into like, um, you know, the history of particular upgrades. And they have this community that they can interact with um, that, that um, you know, people are sort of rab falling down the rabbit hole together. So uh, there's people in this room that have done that. Sean has done that. Marina's done that. Um, and, uh, and it's been a nice onboarding um, uh, way, way to sort of get your feet wet. Um, while having like a full-time job or going to school or things like that. Uh, we recently tried something new, which is start your career in FOSS program. So um, the residency is really outcome driven. You know, you essentially, we ask you to quit your job and focus full time on Bitcoin open source. And that is a big lift for a lot of people. So we can't expect that from everyone. Um, while the seminars are more like sort of book clubs and we aren't seeing, I think, as many outcomes. We can get a lot of throughput. Lot, hundreds of people can go through the seminar, um, but their lives aren't changed. Um, and so we're looking for something that sort of has the best, best of both worlds, and that's a program we're calling Start Your Career in Bitcoin FOSS. Uh, we did our first run of this in January. Uh, it's wrapping up now, and uh, I'm really thrilled with the, um, with the outcome so far. So we had 600 people apply, um, and then we ran them through three months of Essentially, the first month was was katas. Second week or second month was proof of concepts, and now they're really focusing on contributing to projects. Um, David, TDB, um, they've they've those are some of our best um, alums from that program, and I'm, I expect great things from them. So, hello, yeah. So, um, so again, there's sort of like the programming side, the product side, and then there's more infrastructure at the programming level. So, summer of Bitcoin. Kala, um, Library of Satoshi, uh, Bitshala, these are running programs in all different parts of the world and they need curriculum, admissions programs, and essentially like connections so that they can have real outcomes for the, for the work that they're doing. Um, so we try to help with that infrastructure as well. Thank you, Adam. So uh, we started to discuss um, what preferences of choosing profit, uh, projects. So probably you have some priorities in choosing projects. Pro, so can you comment on this as well? So, Mike, please. Sure. From from Brink's perspective, um, I, I think when we started just about four years ago, we thought we were quite focused by doing you know Bitcoin and, and Lightning open source work. And I think we found over the years that maybe that wasn't even focused enough. So we've narrowed the scope to really focusing on 
the Bitcoin Core software, and in particular, a niche within that, which is focused on maybe some of the less glamorous parts of the code base, maintaining the software, security, testing, and review. Uh, we think that there's been a lot of participants who have funded developers over the years, um, exchanges who have funded directly and come up with their own programs. And oftentimes what we've heard from the developers is that they feel the need to have a very high profile, impactful project. And it takes away from their ability to be heads down on, and doing less, um, less interesting but important work on the code base. And so we try to reward those folks doing that um, security and, and maintenance work with, with our, our program um, and not just reward the high profile projects. So that's how we sort of choose to allocate the funds from a development perspective. In terms of how donors might think about um, donating funds if they're not going to run their own program, um, they're, you know, until recently, there was really only a, a few places that that money could go. People spun up their own. People uh, maybe donated to the to the DCI or HRF. Now, you know, Brinks here, uh, OpenSats is here. Uh, there, there's other organizations, in, you know, in the process of being formed that that can do this. So I think if you're considering, <clears throat> if you're in a financial position that you want to consider contributing, look at the mission of each of those organizations and, and see if it fits. We found that m many of our donors are interested in contributing to uh, fairly uncontroversial, fairly highly impactful work on the Bitcoin Core software. Um, and so um, when donors are thinking about that, th they, they come to us. Um, but there's other organizations out there that you should consider. Arsh? Yeah, so how we go about choosing the, the grantees that we accept, um, we have a rolling application basis. So we put out a new grant round every quarter, and it's about 15 projects and individuals. This is a mix of Bitcoin Core developers, uh, people working on eCash, Fediment, Lightning, and also educational initiatives, as I touched on earlier. Um, how we go about vetting these and selecting is um you know a lot of our team is kind of dispersed all over um, so we see the needs that these projects have and we choose them accordingly and when it comes to the technical side of things we do consult with um, developers themselves and other organizations like, like brink and open sats as well um, to kind of choose the best fit and and you know what's what makes the most sense for for bitcoin itself um, and as far as how to go beyond, you know, just selecting these projects and, and contributing, like like Mike okay. said, um, there's now you know we started four years ago as well our our fund, um, and there's a couple main ones to donate to. So um, I'd highly encourage anyone if you're you know if you don't have the technical skills and you, and you want to be involved, um, you know, donate to Bitcoin Open Source Development. Yeah. Thank you, Adam. Do you have something to add? Yeah, we, we don't do grants, um, which is a big relief because grants are hard um, and they there is a huge time commitment and you need to really understand the landscape to do grants properly. So uh, we hire people though, and um, I think we hire the pip, you know, with all due respect, the best people on the planet. Um, and so um, yeah, we're just trying to pull together a really strong team um, and. Uh, and try to get something done in person. Thank you, thank you. That's fantastic what you are doing for the community. And uh, please join the announced uh, initiatives that uh, were uh, announced just recently and uh, just pay attention on the priorities uh, what uh, are required from you. So, and I have some specific questions to you. And Mike, my first question to you. Uh, why is funding Bitcoin core development different from the funding that goes on in other uh, crypto platforms like Ethereum, Solana, and others? Uh, I'm not sure if Willie's here, but I guess thank you to Willie for giving us the opportunity to have this session. I've never been to a Solana. Oh, thank you. Uh, I've never been to a, a Solana or Ethereum Expo. Um, but I have the feeling that they don't have to have this sort of conversation 
um, because oftentimes that funding comes from a single source. Um, I've also tried to look at our counterparts at these other chains who are running development organizations, and I listen to them on podcasts, and uh, quite frankly, none of it is about funding Bitcoin or, or funding open source development because they have a pile of funds already. They're, they're about um, recruiting developers and and recruiting projects to, to build on their protocol. So it is a bit um, a bit more unique in the Bitcoin ecosystem. You know, Satoshi didn't leave us his coins. There's no central foundation. So the difference is that it, it's up to us to to not only build this from a development perspective, if you're curious about that, but it's, it's up for us to, to do all of this. It's up to us to fund this. It's, it's up to us to provide educational resources like Jonas was talking about. Um, and it, it's up to you all to, to find value in that um, and either put your time or, or money towards that. Um, so I think that's, that's the difference between Bitcoin and some of the other funding initiatives. Thank you, thank you for this. And my question to Adam Jones from Chain Code. What common qualities do you Bitcoin open source contributors? What is missing in the Bitcoin open source funding model? Uh, so those are, I think those are two different questions. Um, I'll start with the, what's um, some common qualities. So um, yeah, I, I, I do, a, with the education programs that, that we're involved with, I see a lot of different people um, and People that actually like sort of make it through from, hey, um, this is something I'm interested in to this is something that they do as their full time career. Um, it's a unique set of people. Like it's they're they're special people. And um, you know th the main thing that I see um, is curiosity. So um, I have the pleasure of working with Peter Wella, um, who if you've been around Bitcoin then you, then you know who that is. Um, but it's been um, an education for me to be uh, to work with someone who is just so curious about the world. He's curious about words, weather patterns, like just like how the world is put together. And um, it's really lucky for us that a lot of that attention is put towards Bitcoin um, because he could be doing anything. So um, it's just sort of that insatiable curiosity and. I think one of the great things about Bitcoin is that that uh, you know you'll never be satisfied if you you can just keep finding more and more things um, and you know cryptography and game theory and just the software itself and you know the, the the economics like it's just it's just endless and so for curious people they sort of just get hooked um, and their curiosity takes over. Um, Second thing I see is um, a spirit of generosity. So free open source software um, is a gift to the world. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a statement that I made this for you and you can have it for free. And I don't really care how you use it. If it's useful to you, it's yours. So right from the start, um, that's pretty incredible. But, but then, especially in Bitcoin with the, with the high bar of security, the review um, that's needed is just, it's immense. And so review itself is an act of generosity in my eyes. Um, it is saying that you, you wrote something, you care about something, and I'm gonna spend my cycles, my time, my energy to make sure that it moves forward. And so people who are generous, um, like they really understand what that is and they understand that there's a reciprocity to, if I. If I help someone else, then hopefully they'll help me. And then the last one is just grit. So um, Bitcoin can move at a more deliberate pace than a lot of other software projects uh, because we're, we're building something that's supposed to last for a long time. Uh, and that can be frustrating because you want to get something shipped. Uh, we're all here to, to build something and get it out in the world. And so um, people who have grit, people who can sort of like weigh through that 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 speed or that lack of speed um, to get something real, get something meaningful um, out into the world um, is, is is the third thing I see. So the second question yeah. was what's missing, yeah. and it's a pretty big pivot. Um, so 
I think there's, there's a few things missing from the funding model. The first thing is starter grants. So um, it's really hard to make the jump from full-time software engineer who makes a pretty good living to Bitcoin open source um, engineer that, that lives on grants you know, on a 12 month cycle. Like that is a pretty big ask. And we're, we're, we're not just asking people to take a, you know, often a pay cut, uh, but we're also asking them to sort of give up the stability and give up sort of the, you know, in some cases healthcare and things like that. Like it's a huge ask. And if you, if you add on the, the, the financial pressures of, you know, having a family or having a mortgage or any of those other things, like the, it, it gets harder and harder. So I think, uh, what we're missing is the idea of like a, a minor leagues, like a starter grant to see, you know, how does this work out? Maybe, maybe you know, because um, the grant organizations have to be um, conservative with their funds, that that we're not committing to you know 12 months or two years or, or a lifetime of grants. But um, the idea of something that's short term, let's see how you do. Maybe this is enough for you to take a sabbatical from your job. Maybe this is enough to justify. To your to your um, to your spouse that this is a not a terrible idea, uh, but but we need some some sort of way to bridge that um, because we are we are definitely losing people who are can be valuable contributors because they just can't make that leap of faith. Um, the second thing is bear market protection. Um, I don't think Bitcoin has done an amazing job of um, protecting to the downside. Funding right now is actually pretty good, and um, it's sort of like there's a feeling, I think, among the among the devs in some ways, like you know, it's a little bit easier to get the application through, um, sort of like take it while you can get it kind of thing. And and these are not greedy people; these are just people who know that when the next bear market cycle actually hits, everything is going to dry up, and it's going to become so much harder to actually get funded. So what we I think what we need is you know these organizations. Um, um, to just bear that in mind, um, and 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 to to make sure that you know when the when the price dips and people or you know the the funding or the the funders are feeling a little tighter that we just have a little bit more of a, a treasury to pull from, and then the last one is um, full participation. So, um, I, I you know I, I appreciate what 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 Arsh and, and Mike said about like you know I see funders here and and and, and we do. Um, but there is, there, there is not a feeling of we're all in this together, I think, across the ecosystem. Um, there's, a, there's, there's a lot of businesses that have made a lot of money on Bitcoin. And um, I don't think there's, a, there's an appreciation for what it actually took to get there. Um, and that could be for a few different reasons. One, it could be from total ignorance. You know, Bitcoin just works. And therefore, like, set and forget it. You know, um, you know, if they only knew of some of the bugs that had been taken care of, uh, maybe that would incentivize them more. Um, some of it, I think, is just selfishness. Like, hey, why do I want to put this on my balance sheet? It doesn't look good to investors. It doesn't look good, you know, if it's on a, um, on a public balance sheet. Like, you know, I don't want this loss. Um, and then and then the last one is I think there's still some, or at least previously, I don't know how, how current it is, but there's definitely hostility. Like, the, the you know, if I pay someone, I want them to do what I want them to do, and the, and and Bitcoin open source development doesn't really work that way. So, um, so I, I think like a, a little bit more of a feeling of we're all in this together that we're trying to do something like really big here, um, and that is going to require you know um, people not just sort of doing it altruistically on nights and weekends. Um, I, I I think that feeling you know should be a little bit more pers um, pervasive. Yeah, let's hope that all these missing things will be covered and the industry will develop faster. Well, uh, I also have a question to you, Mike. How have trends in funding Bitcoin developers changed over the years? Well, I guess that, that piggybacks a bit on, on what Jonas said. I, I think if you, looked at, if you look at the trajectory, you know, you had Satoshi essentially donating 100% of of his time to the project and, and not being compensated at all. And if you sort of track that along, at some point, uh, the Bitcoin Foundation funded Gavin and you know Chain Code came along and, and was employing people. If you look at it, it's an upward trajectory. I think 
we're, we're going in the right direction, I think. Um, and maybe that's just bull market talk at the moment. But it does feel like even with the cyclicality of, of the price, it does feel like we're going in the right direction. Um, maybe some insights into trends. People talk about uh, the ETFs and, and our, you know, how's that going to impact development and things like that. Well, you know, so far from my perspective, positively, um, we have a couple providers that have pledged uh, a percentage of their profits towards Bitcoin development. And I think we should see that as a good thing and not a hostile thing, um, maybe to the we're all in this together comment. Um, because I think people generally are trying to be supportive of this work. And uh, the ETF provider story is that there's a whole new industry now. And, and when a new industry springs up built on Bitcoin, um, it's wonderful that they've acknowledged that they're building on top of this software and, and wanting to support that. So I'll, I'll give a shout out again to Hong. Thank you, Hong and Bitwise. Um, thank you to Team Vanek. And there, there's other uh, organizations in different industries that are coming to similar conclusions. So for example, we did a month long partnership with Ledger, the hardware device manufacturer. Um, and, and that promotion went well for them and, and for us. They took a percentage of their um, revenue and, and donated it to, to Brink. Um, and that went so well that they've turned that into an evergreen program now where uh, certain devices, certain percentage of the sales would go to open source development. Um, so it, it, there, there's additionally, there, there's VCs doing this, there's funds doing this. Um, I think we're headed in, in the right direction. I, I think maybe uh, getting these different parties together and, and putting this initiative uh, with, a, with a certain branding to it to, to bring us all uh, under the same umbrella and all in this together maybe is the next step, but it, it does feel like to tie it back together that we're, we're going in the right direction from a trajectory perspective. Thank you, Mike. And uh, the question to you, Arsh about Human Rights Foundation and uh, the incentives, why Human Rights Foundation support uh, open source development in Bitcoin? Yeah, um, it's, it's a good question. A, a lot of people sort of, you know, ask why a human rights NGO, you know, funds, funds Bitcoin. I guess so, some background. Um, the Human Rights Foundation was founded in 2005 by a group of political prisoners. Um, and the reason that it was founded is because you know, they noticed that there's a lot of different human rights organization, um, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty, and while their work is incredibly admirable and, and very much needed, there wasn't one that focuses on authoritarian and closed society specifically. Um, so, you know, 2005, this was before, before Bitcoin, right? So we started to do a lot of advocacy work, you know, just general human rights work, freeing political prisoners, um, getting you know feedback from 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 their family and and just getting tips work like that it was you know not very um not incredibly sustainable um you know fast forward to 2010 mm -hmm. um julian assange spoke at the Oslo freedom forum um and this was just months before he had posted a bitcoin address to, to wikileaks um and there was these instances where you know our our chief strategy officer, Alex Gladstein, he, he saw these things sort of happening. Um, and, and, and in 2013, um, people wrote in to us, this, this group of Ukrainians, um, they were mobilizing what would later become Maidan Square. And they were like, you know, we need Bitcoin, we need fundraising, um, but our bank accounts are cut off. Um, and, you know, our chairman, Gary Kasparov, and, and, you know, and Gladstein, they were just like, okay, like, let's, let's, let's give this a shot. Um, and meanwhile, our friend Roya Maboub, she was also using Bitcoin to fund underground education in Afghanistan. Um, so while we were kind of exploring these different use cases, um, the Human Rights Foundation has always been, um, you know, very, very focused on using technology to empower human rights. So um, giving trainings to activists on how to use VPNs, email servers, you know, just, just freshening up their privacy. Um, and, you know, those same trainings now we do with with bitcoin as as well um so fast forward 2017 we started looking at these use cases and these examples and started incorporating bitcoin in our work so we started accepting bitcoin donations we started doing programming at our events um and 
after realizing, okay, this is something that's not a fad. Like this is something that's going to be around and this is something that we need to get behind. Um, and that's why in 2020, we launched the Bitcoin Development Fund, which focuses on supporting open source development and um, also global education to fit with our um, mission statements. Um, so a lot of the people that we've worked with in these communities, the people who we've platformed throughout the past, you know, 19 years now, mm -hmm. um, money has become an issue for every single one of those people, right? And if you think about it, it makes intuitive sense because these these people are from authoritarian governments, and the first thing that dictators do is they try to freeze your money or cut off your access, so you can't power your movements, you can't, you know, buy materials to protest, very, very basic things, and this might not be a very common thing that people people know about, right? Because I, I assume many people in the room, you know, use a dollar and transact with a dollar. Mm -hmm. It's kind of just like the water that we swim in. So it, it takes something to know about these governments and how they're using money as a weapon against their people. Mm -hmm. um, and people started using Bitcoin. And this is something that works, right? So this is, you know, we wanted to get behind this. Um, and at the end of the day, we're extremely proud to, um, you know, fund and be a part of this this movement that that can't that can't be stopped. Thank you for this. At uh, MIT Crypto Economics Lab, uh, we have a research project with students, which is related to uh, fintech regulations, blockchain uh, in conflict countries, uh, with countries uh, where the war is occurred, and uh, we uh, saw different cases how uh, blockchain technology can support people who suffering from this. And on behalf of Ukrainians, uh, let me tell thank you for all blockchain and Bitcoin community yeah. for supporting us in these difficult times. And also I have to you questions, uh, Arsh, a question to you, Arsh. Why is Bitcoin important for the people you work with? Yeah, so I guess as I just briefly touched on, um, I guess we, we can say from, from the end of our community, right, the people that we've worked with, um, the, the past almost two decades now, um, governments are using money as a tool mm -hmm. against them. They're being, you know, hyperinflated, surveilled, yeah. um, and a lot of people in those countries just don't have access to basic banking. Um, billions of people in the world, right? Like, there's more people in the world that have a, that own a cell phone than yeah. have bank accounts. Like, it, that's that's insane. Um, so, if you can use Bitcoin as as a means, right? Like something that your governments can't inflate, they can't stop, they can't surveil you. Um, that's something that we wanted to put forward to them. So, I mean, even even talking with these people, right? Like, money is such a important thing that mm -hmm. these people need, right? Like, different groups and, and different individuals, they, they need money, but it's also a very sensitive topic to talk about. So, before, before Bitcoin, it wasn't really, a, you know, a thing where people were like, oh yeah, like my government, you know, devalued me by, you know, 50% on a, on a given day. Um, and it wasn't something that activists really talked about. Um, but now opening this conversation around it, it's, it's still something that's very sensitive within the human rights community uh, to talk about money, but it's very important. So brick by brick, we, we you know, we're hoping to kind of build out this, this community of, of activists who can share about Bitcoin, which we've been doing the past, for the past couple of years now. Thank you, Arsh. And before we jump into Q and A uh, sessions, so probably there is something that you want to add or to say something for to our participants uh, of the conference. Uh, if you're curious about the work that we're doing, check out Brink.dev, and I mentioned Bitcoin Ops OPS.org as a as a new site. So check those out, and I look forward to your questions. Yeah. Um, so. You can check out our programs. We write a, a weekly newsletter that covers um, different topics around money and human rights, global news. Uh, you can subscribe at financialfreedomreport.org. Um, we have a new fellowship on uh, cross-input signature aggregation, and that deadline ends next month. Um, we also have a bounty program that expires at the end of this year that's focused on Bitcoin, Lightning, eCash, um, and as I mentioned, we do have a Bitcoin development fund, so we're taking in uh, submissions on a rolling basis. You can go to, to um, Dev Fund, um, hreforg slash Dev Fund to, to learn more about that. Um, if you like rants, 
I have a 20 minute doozy for you tomorrow about why you should choose a career in Bitcoin open source development. So I hope you'll come at 1030 and I'll yell at you for a while. Thank you very much. The audience do have questions to our esteemed panel participants. So yeah, please take your mic. Yeah. Um, I just had a question about what uh, specific advice do you have for smaller projects in the Bitcoin space that aren't necessarily like, you know, Bitcoin core. There's still a lot of small projects that would be really important, like uh, like PayJoin, for example, for, for privacy uh, regarding like human rights, right? So do you have any advice for smaller projects that are still really important to get funding? Yeah, I can, I can go for it. Um, so CoinJoin is something that we supported earlier on. Um, and... This theme of micro grants is, is very important within the Bitcoin space. So I guess like if you're an institutional donor, um, micro grant means like, you know, a hundred thousand dollars or like, you know, a lot of money. Um, but a lot of people would just need, you know, a couple thousand bucks, you know, a couple million sats to, um, kind of kickstart their project. So that's something that we do. We have very flexible grant sizes and we're not, you know, forced to stick to one thing. Um, while supporting Bitcoin core development, giving supplementary grants. Um, I guess one, one thing on that topic is we do have um, a long-term support program coming out later this year, um, which developers can also apply for. But um, yeah, on the, on the micro grant side, it's, it's pretty important to, to get that out there. So anything that, you, anything that you have in particular, I'm happy to talk about it um, after yeah. the conversation. Yeah. Thank you, I'll uh, reach out later. I was just going to add, I, I think starting a project from scratch that you think is going to get a lot of momentum is uh, a mistake for a beginner. Um, I think, you know, um, Dan Gould has done a great job with, with PayJoin, and um, that's because Dan's done this and, and, and been around. And, 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 and so I think if you're, uh, it takes a little bit of, you know, it's like it being a startup founder. It takes a little bit of hubris to be like, oh, I'm going to do something that no one else has done before, and that's going to work. And that's cool. Um, but it wouldn't be my, it wouldn't, it would be my advice for your first stop. Yeah, but, but Dan's got some momentum going, and, um, but it took a while to get, to get there. And, um, and so that's sort of the grit piece that I was talking about. If you're, if you're determined to do something and you have a long timeline, you can probably get there. Um, but you got to convince, you know, this is open source. No one owes you anything. You got to convince them that it's worthwhile. And the last question is probably. Perhaps take advantage of geographic um, arbitrage. Like if you're in Canada, maybe get free health care, which is really important for everyone. Um, Puerto Rico, which is part of America, has 50% matching tax credits, which is identical to a 100% grant with less paperwork. Um, was it El Salvador that's on Bitcoin and maybe the government has? So um, I don't know where you're located, but I could imagine there are other governments besides the US would be a lot more supportive of your efforts and help your devs. Yeah, I think that's a, that's an, it's, it's, a, it's worthwhile to point out. I mean, geographic arbitrage generally is like a pretty, pretty great. Um, and, and, and this sort of speaks to how grants work, um, it, throughout different orgs. Some orgs give flat rates. doesn't matter who you are, where you are. This is what we give. And something in, uh, that number in Mumbai is a little different than it is in New York. So, um, it sort of incentivizes people to be in, you know, in, in different places, but it also mostly incentivizes people to be young and, you know, to not have responsibilities, <laughs> so um, so so it's, sometimes it's incompatible with sort of what we're trying to recruit for often, which is you know veteran uh, people joining joining um, this movement. Thank. You. Is my mic on? Okay. It's just taking a step back here. You say like rather than have your own grand project, try to do something on some existing project. Uh, going a step back from that. Suppose I just wanted to contribute to a project to prove my chops. How would I shop around for projects that need, I mean, you can go on GitHub or look for something like that, but do you have any suggestions on how you could shop around for a place to build your chops? I, I do. Actually then get your first grant? Yeah, so um, last year I spent a lot of time on something that we're calling the Bitcoin Dev Project. Um, 
It's bit, Bitcoin devs X, Y, Z, Bitcoin devs X, Y, Z. And there, there is a, there's a bunch of places of like how to get started, you know, like pathing, start here, read this book, then do this, then do this, then do this. If you're interested in lightning, start here, do this, do this. Um, here's some, you know, synchronous programs, here's some async stuff, and you can sort of pick and choose which works for you at different levels. But beyond that, there's a list of projects that I, uh, is a very um, subjective list of projects um, that uh, we sort of put together that I think have the infrastructure to support on, you know, newcomers. Um, and so, I, you know, in my biased opinion, start there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for, for your contribution, dear community. Please join the initiatives which are developed by uh, the companies of our participants. And thank you very much for your contributions. So, and join to the next panel, which is devoted to custody.